Dementia J. Trump really is Dementia J. Trump. In a jaw-dropping development, even for him, even for his declining acuity, even in the vast fog of Trump, he has just endorsed two rival candidates in the same congressional Republican primary Saturday night at the New York Young Republicans Club. Bo Hines is here. He's going to be a congressman very shortly. Bo Hines, thank you. Saturday night, Trump endorsed Bo Hines, hoping to be chosen as the Republican running for North Carolina's 6th Congressional District. Yesterday, 3.25 p.m., Trump writes, Addison McDowell just announced he is running for North Carolina's 6th Congressional District, has my complete and total endorsement, unquote. Except for that stuff about Bo Hines, he's going to be a congressman very shortly. Something Bo Hines tweeted out at least twice. He's going to be a congressman very shortly, Bo Hines is, as is Addison McDowell, on the same party ticket from the same district. And for that matter, maybe also Christian Castelli will be a congressman very shortly, also from the North Carolina 6th. And Marianne Contogianis, also also from the North Carolina 6th. And Jay Wagner from the North Carolina 6th. And the favorite in the 6th Republican field, former Congressman Mark Walker. I really thought he would endorse Kanto Giannis. She's a plastic surgeon. There is plenty of time for Trump to endorse her, to endorse all six of them. The primary ain't till the 5th of March, you know, the day after the election subversion trial is supposed to start. More on that in a moment. 89 hours apart endorses one guy in public, endorses another guy online, same race. But it's Biden who has cognitive problems. And as always, wait, there's more. The guy Dementia J. Trump endorsed, I mean, the second guy he endorsed, McDowell, he has not even officially announced his campaign or filed the paperwork. As the Capitol Hill correspondent for the News and Observer of Charlotte wrote it plainly but accurately, in a surprising move Wednesday, Trump announced his support in a North Carolina congressional race for a candidate who hadn't publicly announced a campaign. This should stop being a surprise. And it should stop being something you only hear about on this podcast. The man is mentally impaired, declining fast. He doesn't know which number world war the next world war would be. He continually confuses Obama for Biden. He doesn't know what city he's in. He thinks Hungary's Viktor Orban is the dictator of Turkey. And this is after he started with any one or more of a dozen different psychological and maybe physiological problems that could be summarized under the heading, his brain don't work right. With your vote by Christmas, and we're going to have it by Christmas 2024, that's just shortly after the election because of the momentum of our victory we will have a US economy roaring back it is not just a question of what trump would do that he wanted to do but thought he couldn't get away with the first time it is also a question of what trump would do that he would never know he was doing out of sheer mental incapacitation like endorsing two candidates in the same race within 89 hours. On the legal front, and I'm sad to say this is yet to include somebody moving against Trump under Florida's Baker Act, which says that anyone can be forced to undergo involuntary examination if three things are true. One, quote, they are mentally or emotionally impaired to the extent they cannot control their own actions or understand reality. Well, yeah, since 1946. Two, quote, they have refused voluntary examination or because of a mental illness, they cannot understand that an examination is necessary. Uh, Person, woman, man, camera, TV, I aced it. And three, quote, without treatment, they may suffer personal neglect or may cause harm to themselves or others. Wow. Three for three. Hundred percent, Mr. Trump. You aced it. On the legal front, 
it may be time for Jack Smith to drop one of the charges against Trump in the election stealing case. 18 U.S. Code 1505, obstruction of an official proceeding. Because I'm beginning to suspect that even this corrupt and compromised Supreme Court will not have the blindness to send the country into virtual revolution by agreeing with Trump that he and all presidents are cloaked by something that he and his lawyers and maybe his doctors dreamed up called presidential immunity. But they have now announced, the Supreme Court that is, that they will hear an appeal of a case in which Joseph Fisher was convicted of obstruction of an official proceeding for pushing up against Capitol Police on January 6th and encouraging others to enter the Capitol. And Fisher appealed, and his mouthpieces argued that the statute has only ever been applied to the destruction of documents and that he was convicted on the charge even though the DOJ did not even contend he hoped to destroy any actual electoral votes. One Trump-appointed judge has agreed with him. Literally dozens of other judges hearing Fisher's case and the 326 other January 6th insurrectionists convicted of obstruction of an official proceeding, including the three-court panel to which DOJ appealed the verdict for Fisher and against obstruction of an official proceeding, all of those judges, dozens of them, ruled against this claim, insisting it is a distinction without a difference. And if the law applies to trying to obstruct an official proceeding by tearing up paper, it sure as hell also applies to trying to obstruct an official proceeding by tearing up limbs. And especially by the way Trump did it. And Jack Smith still should drop the charge. Because the point isn't about what exactly 18 U.S. Code 1505 applies to and what it does not apply to. It is that the Supreme Court is going to weigh in. And it can find for the DOJ and against Trump. And that's still a win for Trump because it runs out more of the clock. January, February, March, April, when will it rule? Jack Smith already showed he is aware of this. He asked the Supreme Court to bypass appeals rulings and decide immediately, right now, get it over with about the presidential immunity nonsense. He should do the same here. Drop obstruction of an official proceeding. Pursue conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, conspiracy against the right to vote and have one votes counted. Because as it is, Judge Chutkin just paused all procedural deadlines in the election stealing case because the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and or the Supreme Court have not definitively put a stake through the heart of this presidential immunity bullshit. Just yesterday, Trump's lawyers, John Lauro, Todd Blanche... John Sauer, how many others? No man can count that high. His lawyers resorted to complaining that the proposed trial schedule would disrupt their family holiday and travel plans for Christmas and New Year's, like they wouldn't bill Trump more for those hours, and like they, or any families they might, might once or might yet have, would care about Christmas if it meant instead more billable hours at higher rates. Quote, It is as if the special counsel growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming, I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. But how? Boys, your client just endorsed two guys in the same race and he's loved by his cult members because he's a sadist. Maybe you want to drop any future references to the Grinch. So who am I to tell you how to run up your bill? Seriously, Mr. Special Counsel, the March 4th trial start, D-Day, the launch, the launch of Dementia J. Trump into the sun is already in jeopardy. The nation is on fire. What matters is how much you can pull out of the burning building in time, not that you try to pull all of it out. Also, hey, Jim Jordan, who defied a congressional subpoena as part of the crowd of cowards threatening to prosecute Hunter Biden for defying a congressional subpoena. Nancy Mace was just there and hoped she'd get to see more pictures of Hunter's junk. James Comer, Jim Jordan, Jason Smith and their colleagues have distorted the facts by cherry picking lines from a bank statement manipulating texts I sent, 
editing the testimony of my friends and former business partners, and misstating personal information that was stolen from me. There is no fairness or decency in what these Republicans are doing. They have lied over and over about every aspect of my personal and professional life, so much so that their lies have become the false facts believed by too many people. No matter how many times it is debunked, they continue to insist that my father's support of Ukraine against Russia is the result of a non-existent bribe. They displayed naked photos of me during an oversight hearing. And they have taken the light of my dad's love, the light of my dad's love for me, and presented it as darkness. They have no shame. I like Hunter Biden. I like that aggressiveness. I like that anger. I like that righteous indignation. I like the naming of the cowards' names. As with his father, I'd like him to swear more. And the gist of his argument is demonstrably true. Not only should you never go into a closed hearing with a Republican, especially a proven liar like James Comer, a man accused by his own college girlfriend of beating her and calling her mother up and saying he was going to kill her. Not only should you never give a creature like that the chance to manipulate you the way Joseph McCarthy used to manipulate the innocent, but you should never let Comer, hell, Joseph McComer, move more than a foot in either direction without reminding everybody that he offered Hunter Biden his choice of a private deposition or the public hearing Hunter Biden showed up for yesterday. Hunter Biden's more than welcome to come in front of the committee. He's invited today. We will drop her. We're in the downhill phase of this investigation now because we have so many documents and, and we can bring these people in for depositions or committee hearings, whichever they choose. I stole that mashup off Congressman Moskowitz's feed. As to Hunter's father, all Trump's House Republican slaves made their squeaks of protests and let loose the tiny slivers of their souls that Trump still doesn't own. And yet every goddamned one of them, even Ken Buck, righteous lame duck, more like milkshake duck, Every one of them has now voted to further the Republican show trial hours after the Dow Jones, which Republicans consider the only barometer of the nation's health, hit an all time high. The phony impeachment has now moved from committee examination, which isn't a thing, to a formal inquiry, which also isn't a thing. Biden's transgressions are so urgent, so pressing, so threatening to the life of the nation that the Republicans voted on this inquiry and then immediately went on vacation for the rest of the year. Well, to be fair, they have to get back to their home districts because you never know when Lord and Master Trump will endorse them and their primary challengers. Worms, useless, self-debasing worms in a bottomless pit of Trump's manure. Well, frankly, there is one bit of imagery I immediately regret. But this impeachment kabuki theater, there is more evidence against James Comer about his college girlfriend than there is about Joe Biden about anything. So why not open an inquiry about James Comer, too? This crap is so obviously and nauseatingly purely political that you know who wrote a piece bemoaning the perversion of the impeachment process? You know who even noticed this? Chuck Todd. And that's ironic, because long before Chuck Todd was at NBC News, but not before I was, you know which network let itself be played like the proverbial $2 banjo by a corrupt Speaker of the House and an even more corrupt special prosecutor to impeach Bill Clinton solely to dirty him up? You know which network let themselves be used like that, be prostituted like that? NBC News. Impeachments used to feel like the ultimate political punishment, writes Chuck Todd. But somewhere along the way, impeachment became just another political campaign tactic. Somewhere along the way. Gee, thanks, Chuck. Nobody had noticed that. Earlier this year. Or, you know, in 1998 when it first happened. But good on you for writing 
1,948 words in your column on NBCNews.com, which is apparently a regular thing now to which you have devoted yourself since they fired you from Meet the Press. Good insight, like both sides in the impeachment of Trump for blackmailing another head of state for dirt on his own rival for his own presidency, and then the other impeachment of Trump for trying to, you know, end democracy. Both sides in that with the impeachment of Bill Clinton for, as Chuck slipped and wrote, an affair with an intern. Chuck also graced us with two uses of the cliche, the political death penalty, and such watered down, I can't offend Trump, he might be fewer in 13 months, insights as, quote, much of the impeachment fever on the right is driven by Trump and his grievance campaign. No crap, Chuck? Really? Much? There's the obligatory, as I've said numerous times to any elected Republican I've interviewed about Hunter Biden, and then the moral appeal to how Republicans concerned about politicians making money off of government should also be outraged by the Trump family and cronies. And you wonder if Chuck really thinks there are still human beings inside any elected Republican he's interviewed who has already let Trump pull his bone marrow out of him with a sippy straw. I mean, now that Chris Saliza, like Skynet, has become self-aware and actually made an online joke asking which face was more punchable, Vivek Ramaswamy's or Chris Saliza's, we need a new source of this kind of old drivel that Chris used to do for us and now Chuck has taken over the reins. But honestly, I'd rather have read about NBC's role in the perversion of impeachment into this undisguised political character assassination, because even before I read Chuck, and I'll give him this, he reads just as smarmy as he sounds. I was thinking about Monday, September 21st, 1998, which might someday be agreed upon as the official end date of the original American form of government. That morning, just after 9 a.m., a feed began in a television control room being controlled by the House Judiciary Committee, then as now run by a bunch of scumbag Republicans who could defect to the Russian Duma tomorrow and fit in seamlessly, maybe not even needing translators. One of them finally figured out how to press play on one of the videotape machines with their Satanist hooves. And in the master controls at NBC News and ABC News and CBS News and CNN and C-SPAN and Fox News and CNBC and MSNBC and countless other networks and outlets around the nation, somebody in each one of them said, here it comes. And there started playing on all American networks exactly at the same time it was being fed out by the Republican Judiciary Committee. There came the videotaped grand jury testimony of William Jefferson Clinton, 42nd president of the United States, in the special counsel's investigation into what that old, dead, pervert Ken Starr liked to pretend was not sex with an intern. Broadcast immediately by the Republicans in the Judiciary Committee at their command via every network in this country into every home using television at 9 a.m. September 21, 1998. Grand jury testimony, secret, sacrosanct, not even to be quoted outside the courtroom without the consent of the witness. On August 17th of that year, President Clinton had testified to four hours of pornographic questions from the staff of this dead psycho star. And within days, that untouchable videotape of his untouchable testimony had been illegally given to the House Judiciary Committee by the dead special counsel scumbag star. And literally 36 days later, the House Judiciary Committee illegally gave it to the broadcast networks and the cable networks for public dissemination. And every one of them, every goddamned last one of them, NBC included, and MSNBC, where I was the principal anchor, and CBS and ABC and all the others, every goddamn last one of them transmitted it live and without interruption for four goddamn hours, just as it was received from the Republicans in the House. Not one network, not one even dared to say, we're going to delay this like 10 minutes so we can provide some context to what you're seeing. Not one, let alone dared to say, hey, is this journalism? Is this, uh, is this right? 
Is this, is this, what is it? Isn't this grand jury testimony? Is this America? Not one of the supposed great television newsmen of the day, not Peter Jennings, not Jim Lair, not Bernard Shaw, not Sam Donaldson, not that great flaming fraud Brokaw, not even Dan Rather, nor my late friend Tim Russert, not one of them succeeded, nor to my knowledge even tried to even slow down the total hijacking of American TV news by one political party intent on removing the president from the other political party who had been elected not two years before by a margin of 220 electoral votes. Not one goddamned journalist in television stood up and said no. None of them tried to intervene on behalf of the secrecy of the grand jury. None of them tried to intervene on behalf of the dignity of the presidency, even when the president has not been dignified. None of them even tried to intervene to make the world safe for impeachment. We may have begun to lose our political souls when Ronald Reagan's people got the Iranians to delay releasing the hostages to help him win the 1980 election over Jimmy Carter. We may have begun to lose that soul the day Richard Nixon greenlighted the Watergate cover-up. Hell, we may have begun to lose it during the months after the crooked and contested 1876 presidential campaign. Blame Tilden. But whatever we had left went out the window on September 21st, 1998, when the last line of defense, ably manned by slobs like Andy Lack and Andrew Hayward and David Weston, the last line of defense protecting our form of government said, what are you talking about? We can't do what's right. Fox News is running this live. We'll get killed in the ratings. We've got to protect our phony baloney jobs, gentlemen. That was it. Everything since that date has been in one fashion or other, reruns. I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. You watch your ass. Also of interest here, a liar who got caught lying while running for Congress is running again, and he needed to get Elon Musk to pull a few strings so people would not know he's lying again. And given that the guys I just mentioned there... Andrew Lack, Andrew Hayward, David Weston, they were the presidents of NBC News and CBS News and ABC News, and they were $2 banjos upon which Newt Gingrich and Ken Starr played. Given that they were the presidents of the network news divisions, what do you think Elon frickin' Musk did when faced with a choice of right or expediency? Do you think he stood up for what was right? <laughs> That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Elberman. Come on, Countdown. It is happening today to broadcasters and podcasters and streamers who were born in the year 2000. That unexpected moment, universal to life, but particularly annoying when you're a broadcaster. When you're 30 years old or 25 or, in my case, you're 20, and some other broadcaster you're working with comes up to you and says, You know, I used to listen to you when I was a kid. It is literally the day your own youth dies. I've been on both ends of this conversation. I've been the sayer and the sayee. Details next in things I promise not to tell. First time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. And first, an update. Well, even a climate change conference run by an oil sultan can't get away with not mentioning the fatality of fossil fuels, it turns out. Hours after I recorded yesterday's, COP28 did put out a closing statement encouraging, quote, transitioning away from fossil fuels and energy systems by around 2050, which of course will be too late. And of course it's non-binding. 
And of course, the Republicans will repudiate it if they seize power, in which half of these grotesquely and deliberately ignorant people in that party think is woke because it has the word transition in it. Now to today's medalists, the bronze, worse, Elon Musk, his little crap shack social media site X, formerly Twitter, the Sports Illustrated of social media, it broke yesterday. At least the links to other news sites and other real media locations broke for several hours in the middle of the business day. And since Musk has denuded the place of all its actual value except A, disseminating white supremacism and other hatred, B, fundraising for dogs on death row, and C, links to news sites and other real news media locations, we got our first look at what Twitter would be without news organizations and others tweeting links of their own work. Turns out we can live without it. Even the dogs can live without it. We're developing an app for the dogs. Nice work, Elmo. Runner-up worser? Elon Musk. His little crap shack car company, Tesla, the sports illustrated of the automotive industry, has a small problem. There are about 2 million Teslas on America roads today, and the company is now recalling about ooh, roughly 2 million out of the roughly 2 million. The autopilot feature does not work correctly, and it turns out, yes, it did contribute to many of the thousands of crashes during which autopilot was engaged. Happily, there's no indication Elmo has to recall the Cybertruck. What? It's because they've made so few Cybertrucks that Musk can evade safety testing on them so far? To borrow a line from my old friend David Letterman, you got here in a Tesla? Congratulations, you've cheated death. But the gold medal winner, the worst, Elon Musk, right-wing nut job. His party, the Republicans, the Sports Illustrated of political parties, can depend on Musk to do its bidding for them. The Ohio senator who hopes to someday challenge Mitch McConnell for the Senate leadership, the leadership in chins, am I right? J.D. Vance posted at 2.34 p.m. Monday that, quote, in 2022, National Democrats lied about J.R. Majewski and his service record. Too many Republicans ran from these dishonest smears instead of fighting them. J.R. is running for Congress in 2024, and I'm proud to support him, unquote. Then there's a picture of Vance's lord and master dementia, J. Trump, with Majewski, who claimed, still claims, he was in combat, and he's never in combat. Hours later, community notes, the underground, the French resistance of Twitter, corrected Vance's lie, quote, J.R. Majewski did, in fact, misrepresent his service record during his 2022 congressional campaign, according to United States military documents obtained by the Associated Press through a public records request, unquote. And underneath that are links to the Air Force Times. <laughs> but at 7.45 p.m. Monday, Majewski tweeted, quote, Hey, Elon Musk, the disinformation Dems are adding false community notes to Senator Vance's post, and he provided his own link to the fascist propaganda site Breitbart. By 10.50 p.m. Tuesday, a little over 27 hours later, Majewski tweets again, false community notes removed. So Majewski or Vance or somebody got Musk or somebody else at Twitter X. How many people still work there besides Musk? That Nancy woman from NBC, did she do this? Somebody silenced the last lonely burp of honest free speech on Twitter. Free speech being the other thing Musk sells besides self-crashing cars. Did so to defend a Republican mook who padded his military resume because Elon has decided fascism will allow him to sell even more self-crashing cars. Elon, free speech is meaningless unless you let people that you don't like Say things you don't like, unless the truth hurts a fascist, in which case you have to urinate on free speech. Musk, today's worst person in the world. number one story on the countdown and my favorite topic me and things i promised not to tell i believe it was this time of year early winter 39 years ago that the cbs television station here in new york channel 2 dismissed a news reporter named charles crawford 
I was reminded of him the other day because he bridges two stages of my life that from this advanced age feel like two separate lives. Until I was about 15 and went out on my first date, I spent all of my time doing about four things and four things only. Going to school, going to baseball games, collecting sports memorabilia, and trying to figure out how I was going to be a sportscaster or sports writer when I grew up. Incidentally, I think I'm now up to doing about six things and six things only. Anyway, in 1971, the fact that there were adults who collected baseball cards and spent literally hundreds of dollars on some of them was sprung on an unsuspecting America. The first big card convention, a gussied up flea market in a Detroit area hotel over a three day weekend to which some people traveled from other states was so completely unbelievable that CBS News sent a crew and a reporter to cover it. The story closed out in an edition of the CBS Evening News one night, and I think it so shocked anchorman Walter Cronkite that he said, gosh, or something, before recovering to sign off. That's the way it is, Monday, August 23rd, 1971. Walter Cronkite, CBS News. And I... The couple of thousand of us who constituted the entirety of the known baseball card hobby all let out a squeal of delight in front of our black and white TVs, and the mainstreaming of baseball cards began. The most amazing part of it was it was almost all adults. There was a kid my age in Indianapolis named Elliot Doc who had a fabulous collection. There was another one near Philly named Robert Lifson. And he and I have been friends 50 years now, and he was over at the apartment in December talking cards. There were some other older teenagers, 17, 18, 19, but other than that, it was all adults. Adults who had either secretly never stopped collecting baseball cards or had resumed collecting them and who could enjoy everything from a newly issued Reggie Jackson card to a newly discovered example from the set issued by Kalamazoo Bats Cigarettes in 1888. In 1972, the first such card show in the metropolitan New York area was held, and at the age of 13, I went with my parents and sister in tow, and I had, for me anyway, a transcendent experience. And they did not, unless you consider a summer weekend in a hotel in Lake Ronkonkoma, New York, transcendent. At least there was a pool, and it didn't rain. Anyway, the next year, in partnership with some others, one of the really good people in the hobby, an adult named Mike Arenstein, also still a friend of mine 50 years later, the man who basically invented everything from plastic sheets to keep your cards in, to reprints of old cards, to cards of minor league players, he staged the first show in New York City in a union hall all the way downtown, bang, on Astor Place over the Memorial Day weekend. He was told he was going to lose his shirt on this. In fact, by early Friday evening, like two hours after the thing opened, the crowd was so large and dense, I could not see from my chair behind the table I had bought, from which I was selling my duplicates, to the table directly across the aisle from me, which was no more than 20 feet away. It was such a success, Mike hurriedly booked the hall for a second show for Thanksgiving. Well, by now, 1973, if you put a bunch of these crazy adults paying good money to buy old baseball cards, $25 for a 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle? Are these people escapees from a psychiatric facility? Well, if you did that, some reporter was going to show up and cover the lunacy. This was especially true of local television news, especially on a weekend where a story that was not exactly like every other story that you could shoot before noon, develop the film and get it on the air at 6 p.m. That was a gift from the gods, which is how I came to see a little commotion at the front door of that 1973 Memorial Day weekend card show and see emerging from the commotion, a man carrying a small TV camera followed by another man carrying a big TV boom microphone, followed by another man who was Charles Crawford, the reporter from Channel 2 News. I knew it was him because I knew everybody on TV in New York in 1973 by sight, because I watched as much TV news as I could because, bluntly, I was studying it. 
My dad was at my table with me, and while I hoped that Mr. Crawford would come over and interview me among the hundreds of collectors and dealers there, my dad was a little less reliant on happenstance and accident and was more hands-on. Be right back, he said. And the next thing I knew, he was buttonholing Charles Crawford and gesturing back towards me. And the next thing I knew after that, Charles Crawford was standing in front of my table asking me a few questions, but mostly asking me to show his cameraman how I was able to use my, quote, filing system so sophisticated it allows him to find any card a collector might want in seconds. That was it. My television debut. No soundbite. Not even my name, just my hands, pulling out a drawer from a small filing cabinet and deftly locating a 1968 Rico Petroselli card, or whatever it was. There was also about three seconds of me looking straight towards the camera, just as Charles Crawford told me to, my eyes a mixture of abject fear and an inscrutable scheming quality which quite bluntly at its essence amounted to my internal dialogue about how I could get Charles Crawford to surrender his camera crew and his job so I could go leave the card show and work for Channel 2 News that night. I have gone into excruciating detail about my career timeline, and for purposes of the Charles Crawford story, I will only hit the bullet points. This is the year 1973. By 1975, I was on the air at the professional commercial radio station owned by Cornell students. In 1978, I was an intern at the news assignment desk and for the sportscaster at another New York TV station, Channel 5. In 1979, I got my first full-time job at UPI's radio network. In 1981, I got my first TV gig as a substitute sports reporter for CNN in New York. In 1982, I got that job full-time. And now back to 1983, when they started letting me anchor for the first time, a daily four-minute sportscast every night at 5.45 in the middle of the newscast that was co-anchored by CNN's vice president and New York bureau chief, Mary Alice Williams. One day, now at the age of nearly 25, a cynical veteran of 28 months in television, I came down from our offices on the 25th floor to our studio in the lobby of One World Trade Center to do my sportscast. But apparently, Mary Alice Williams was off that day because when I got to the anchor desk at 542 or so, the anchor at the desk in her place was Charles Crawford. The same Charles Crawford. The Charles Crawford who had put me on TV a decade before from the 1973 card show at the District 65 Union Hall on Astor Place. A co-anchor in Atlanta teased my sportscast, and when we went to the commercial break, Charles Crawford introduced himself to me, and I said, we've met. And he said, oh, how, when? And I said, well, I'll tell you now so you can recover during the sportscast. And as I quickly recounted it and quoted his narration word for word, this 14-year-old has a filing system so sophisticated it allows him to find any card a collector might want in seconds. I told him that, and his face got whiter and whiter and whiter And he told me not to worry if he got up and left while I was doing the sportscast because he needed to walk around for a bit and get some air. To his credit, when we came back from my report, he introduced me as his old friend. When he came back and said, don't misunderstand me, I'm not offended or anything. I'm glad you made it, but just remember this will happen to you someday too. I mean, I'm only 47. And I laughed and I told him it already had happened to me that I had gone back to my college radio station a year after I had graduated, and a kid walked up to me and said he was just starting to train as a sportscaster there, and he had been listening to me since he was 11 years old. And I went whiter than Charles Crawford did on that set, and I said, how in the hell does that work? I'm only 21. I only started here five years ago. And he explained he was still attending Ithaca High School at the moment, and he was only 16. And I told Charles Crawford that my response was not like his, to go for a walk. I said, I went out and went for a drink. And Charles said, that's also my plan as soon as the newscast is over. I'll buy you one. He couldn't have been nicer. And just as I was leaving CNN the next spring, they were hiring him full time. And he eventually became CNN's chief science correspondent. He was still with them in the late 90s. And he passed away in 2016 at the age of 81. I remember him for the 1973 card show, of course, but also for that drink at the bar that was literally 100 yards from CNN New York front door. He had all kinds of advice about dealing with TV executives. These people are as dangerous 
as anything in this world, and I was a pilot instructor in the Air Force for eight years. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Do me a solid. Tell somebody who does not listen to listen. Tell them they can call me up and say they used to listen to me when they were a kid. Get them to listen. Countdown has come to you from the Vin Scully Studios at the Old Roman Broadcasting Empire in New York. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. Mr. Ray on guitars, bass, and drums, produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. Sports music is courtesy of ESPN Inc. It was written by Mitch Warren Davis. It's called The Old Roman Theme from ESPN2. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend John Dean, and everything else was pretty much my fault. So that's Countdown for this, the 1073rd day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the Insurrection Act against him and them while we still can and before he endorses somebody else in the North Carolina 6th. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. Because of the momentum of our victory, we will have a Unis economy roaring back.